Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Martin Ford, and I am a consultant with the Carolite Renewable Energy Community. Um, today, I have the pleasure of hosting this webinar with the Journal for Caribbean Environmental Sciences and Renewable Energy, um, or CSER. Uh, this is the fourth webinar that we're doing in collaboration with them. And today's topic, we're going to be speaking about a word that has been on the tip of your tongue for the last few years, resilience. Is resilience just a buzzword in the Caribbean? And are we truly becoming climate ready? Now, today I have the pleasure of introducing my guest, um, Ms. Anaiti Mills from the Office of the Prime Minister in Jamaica, Ms. Tamisha Eitel from the Barbados Environmental Conservation Trust, and Ms. Daphne Ewing Chow, um, senior contributor with Forbes magazine. Um, I'm going to turn it over to them to just introduce themselves and give a bit of their role. But before I do that, I would like to remind the audience that if you have questions, you can submit them in the questions panel, and I'll be monitoring um, to, so that we can have the Q&A session in the last 15 minute section of the webinar. Okay, so let's get going. Um, Anaiti, please, would you introduce yourself to the audience and speak a bit about your current role? Um, certainly, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, everybody from wherever you're tuning in. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, for this invitation uh, for hosting me. Thank you to the team of Cesare. Um, I'm very excited to be here and, and, and share this, this, this discussion with these fantastic ladies. Um, my name is Anaita Mills. I am currently a climate finance advisor at the Office of the Prime Minister in Jamaica. I collaborate with the, the government on, on, on many aspects uh, relating to climate finance, transparency, resiliency. I provide technical and research inputs into, um, into different positions, political positions, and, and, and also the government's international, um, you know, international statements and interventions in in, in events, uh, mostly connected to the United Nations and to climate funds. I also collaborate with the Climate Change Division at the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. I, I've been living here in Jamaica for almost six years. I'm originally from, from Guatemala, uh, from Caribbean uh, uh, background. My father is from, was, is from Jamaica. And and that's in a nutshell what I'm what I'm doing right now. I come from from working in in the international um, development um, sector, so to say. And again, happy to be here. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, to my show, would you please uh, introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good night. Wherever you are in the world. My name is Tamisha Eitel. I am the executive director of the Barbados Environmental Trust, which is part of the Conservation Collective, which is a global group of funds that seeks to enhance the capacity of environmental organizations or groups doing environmental work in sustainability across the globe. I run the fund here in Barbados, which started in September last year. And I am a fundraiser, uh, not necessarily a technical expert, but I focus on the fundraising and the resource mobilization for organizations. And uh, I come from a background in international development and I've worked in everything from education to environment, to health, to uh, civil society and NGO NGOs are my passion. So um, I'm really excited to be part of this panel and you know, talk about where we are right now and buzzwords. Of course, first, thank you. And uh, Daphne, please uh, introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Daphne Ewing Cho. I am a senior contributor um, in the area of food systems and sustainability at Forbes. Most of my writing, um, if 
you know, for those of you who are interested in the Caribbean, um, focuses on the Caribbean. And I try to bring a global audience to issues surrounding sustainability, resilience, the environment, largely from the perspective of agriculture. I am also the head of content at Loop Cayman. And my professional background has taken me throughout, I would say the finance, and food and agriculture sectors um, all sort of combined. I used to work at the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, also, I'm originally from Barbados. Um, so, I, hi to all the Bajans. I'm currently living in the Cayman Islands. And my academic background is actually in international economics. So I have a master's in international economics. So I kind of merge all of my experiences in agriculture, finance, all of those together in my work. Well, thank you guys very much for joining us. Um, I know these are these are some very different times. Um, for the audience, we wanted to kind of gather a bit of uh, feedback on just your perception of resilience in the region. Um, so if you just take a second, uh, please look at your screen. Um, there should be a poll. The first question is, do you think that the word resilience is overused or often misunderstood in the climate agenda? Now, I'll give you guys a few seconds to respond. Right. So let me share those results. Um, so 50% of you said sometimes, 34% um, of you said yes, and 8% said no. Um, and IT, are you, uh, I'm just gonna ask you to turn on the camera right now, um, but are you, are you surprised by those results? You know, I'm absolutely not surprised. And, and um, I, I would like to say that I, 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 will, I would like not to, to be too prescriptive about conceptualizing um, resilience, but I do understand and over the years in working in international development, that the concept of resilience is oftentimes interchangeably used with vulnerability, with adaptation and sustainability. And those are you know, different concepts, but not divorced. So I'm not surprised about, uh, about the results at all. Um, so I'll stop there while, yeah. while Get more feedback. What 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 about you, Tamisha? Uh, on mute. Yes, it worked. Um, uh, the so my response on if I what I think about these results and um, if it's overused. I don't have a. I come from a communications background as well, so the overuse of a word. It, it helps to use a word in certain times because that's where the funding application comes. That's what people are responding to in this space. So I'm not surprised that it's pretty, it's scattered. Um, and I'm not surprised that there are a lot of yeses because especially if you work in the space or are interested in the space, all the documents you read will say resilience, 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 resilience. Uh, mm. So I can assume a lot of the attendees here have been, had a lot of, had some experience at, into the development world of, uh, of climate change. So the world resilience really does get overused, but a lot of people do not encounter the word as much. Um, and in, 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 in my life in general, I only see hear of resilience in either climate change or in young people. And if young people are resilient enough to cope with the chaos of the world <laughs> in general. So not surprised with this. Yeah. 
And 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 what about you, Daphne? As a journalist, um, you must see shifts occur in the use of different language. So, um, what are your I, thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely agree with the ladies what they've just said. I think um, resilience has become a buzzword. Um, I think it's almost a bit of a marketing term. It's um, used in content strategies. Um, it's absolutely, for me, I agree um, with the opinions out there. Um, I think um, with what Anita said with regards to the fact that people are confusing adaptation, mitigation, and resilience, I do believe that obviously they have to work together. And I think that people don't understand the different definitions of those terms. I also believe that the word resilience is used a lot for greenwashing and to convey that you are doing your part for environmental responsibility when in many cases um, we have situations, for example, within tourism where we pretty much in, in the region put all of our eggs in that basket. And we talk about resilience, but tourism at its, as it's currently being practiced in the region is not very resilient at all and it's currently we're seeing that with the whole COVID-19 thing um we're, we're beginning to see that we're not as resilient as we thought we were well I mean thank you for sharing that I mean like I guess this opens up the the following poll um uh so do I want the audience to answer if they think that the the Caribbean is advancing climate action quickly enough in a post Paris Agreement era? Just going to give you guys a few more seconds to answer the poll. Right. So looking at the uh, results, 69% um, of you said no and 23% are unsure and 8% said yes. Um, I personally am not surprised at the sentiment, but um, I'm very I'm very interested in hearing what you guys think um, on IT. Um, again, I'm not surprised and I agree. Uh, I think we have to remind ourselves that there's there's a, a key element of this question, which is quickly enough. Um, we are advancing and, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, post Paris Agreement, the Caribbean has absolutely advanced progress. There's many changes, there's policies in place, there's you know, units in place, ministries in place. Um, and there's, um, there's a, a, a myriad of projects and interventions in, in, in that are currently being implemented in our countries. So yes, we're advancing. Quickly enough? No, definitely not. Hmm. Definitely not. Tamaisha, what are your thoughts on, on it? So obviously we all want everything to happen quickly, but in the grand scheme of things, five years is not a long time. This is a whole behavioral shift that has to happen. And as a donor, you can get money out there, you can find money to do things, but it's the capacity of people to implement projects and it's the interest of the average citizen to get involved. The climate change action isn't just top down, there's a lot of bottom up approach. Uh, majority of peers don't recycle, the majority of peers don't know what they're pouring down their drain. So you can't expect uh, the climate action uh, uh, train to keep going if it only is working with one wheel. The governments can create as much as they want, but if you don't have a populace who's ready and willing to engage, there's only so much change that will happen. Doesn't mean that we have not, as Anaiti said, done a lot. There has been a, a huge drastic shift in the last five years in this direction. So 
um, I still remain hopeful and positive. Hmm. And and uh, Daphne, how do you how do you perceive this? Um, I, I agree with what um, these two ladies have said wholeheartedly. I think yes, obviously, um, policy infrastructure has been put in place, and on a on a very positive side. Because we're smaller, our ease of implementation is obviously enhanced. But then on the flip side, there are economic restrictions. We don't have the money that some of our more developed counterparts have. So there are certain policies and forms of infrastructure that we cannot put in place. And of course, that could be seen in the area of renewable energy, in, in large technologies that are, we just cannot afford. Also, um, an issue that I've always had that I tend to expound upon quite frequently in my writing and I get beat up over from time to time is I feel like we tend to fall back on this um, sort of woe is me victimhood stance where because we are small island developing states and we don't contribute on an aggregate level to um, this massive amount of global carb carbon emissions just by a function of our size, that this is not really, um, because obviously we're the most vulnerable, but people say, okay, well, we aren't contributing to this, but we actually are, because even though we're only contributing about 0.2% of all of world emissions, on a per capita level, we're putting out about 6.73 metric tons of carbon per capita, which is three times the world average. So technically, we are not doing our part. Daphne, I'm so happy that you raised that because even at a political level, that's one of the first, you know, advice that that we give the prime minister here in Jamaica from the climate change division. We have to change the narrative of saying that we are, you know. We, we are not contributing and, and you know, we, we're not contributing and therefore we were, we, you know, there's not a big expectation of what's, you know, what should we do? We have to change that narrative. That narrative is, is, is old. I completely agree. I completely agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I agree with you all too, um, because we all work in different sectors and we're seeing it from different perspectives. I know from the energy side, I've seen in the last 10 years, I've seen such a huge shift, even um, even in a shift in the way people share information. Um, and this, this is something that I feel intersects with other sectors. And um, the last poll question that I had actually was trying to identify which sector um, the audience may think is the least resilient um, in the Caribbean. So if they just look to their screens, um, please select which of these sectors, the agricultural, the energy sector, healthcare and social sector, telecommunications and ICT, or the financial services. I'm really excited to see the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, is, this is a very <laughs> difficult question. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing the, the, the bars of the poll go up and down in the background. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, my gosh. I'm just going to give the audience just a few more seconds to, to answer those polls. Okay, I'm not surprised by this one, personally. Um, what, 48% of you said agriculture, 21% um, energy, uh, then healthcare, then financial services, and then telecoms. Uh, are, are, you, are, you, are you panelists surprised by that? I'm not. Yeah, well, um... I have to say I'm a little bit surprised. I, 
I wouldn't have completely jumped into agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's there's have been there have been some some really interesting re uh, breakthroughs in crop resilience um, happening in the Caribbean. Uh, there's uh, uh, I have seen and been inspired about the awareness of our farmers and the capacity of of implementing. Um, climate resilient measures in, in their own farms, uh, whether it's uh, through water uh, catchment or, or water infrastructure or storage, and also, you know, being open to, to implement alternative farming techniques. Um, it might be, it might be that I, I was thinking about, you know, uh, taking a, a more, you know, national program approach, and and you know, supported with with the right the right policy, maybe. Um, I wouldn't have jumped into into agriculture though. Mm -hmm. well, can I a, ask? Can I yeah. ask Anita which one she would have picked as number one? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think. I think financial services. Okay. I think financial services. Uh, we all know that the region is is definitely and largely underinsured. Um, um, we don't have the the right uh, financial products and services that can actually provide. Uh, finance to to our small and medium enterprises to implement climate resilience, independently of what sector. Um, I, I don't think, or I have I have to be cautious to say there's limited understanding in the commercial and the and the banking sector of resiliency and climate investment and climate proofing and, and climate smart. There's not enough uh, financial products for that and. On top of that, and I think again we we have seen some advance, but the multilaterals and our, our international partners need to come up with innovative instruments so we can uh, in the region access more concessional financing and and stop this vicious cycle of of debt. So I will have gone completely to financial services. Mm. So, and Daphne. Yeah. Your, your thoughts. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I absolutely um, am on the agriculture bandwagon. Um, I agree with the strong response that agriculture has traditionally been the least resilient. I do agree with Anita that changes are being made. I do think that farmers are becoming more aware and this sort of older generation of farmers is being replaced by younger um, farmers who are more aware of what's going on with the environment and are responding and adapting. However, that said, we have a lot of infrastructural issues. For one, we cannot afford the type of technology on a mass scale that will enable us currently to be fully resilient in the face of natural disasters, in the face of drought. These issues affect us every single year. Um, one of our listeners, I'm sure he must be on, um, Ralph, if you're there, he, um, he is in the greenhouse business and um, they produce greenhouses that um, are built to withstand a category five hurricane and Something like that, which is so es essential, um, obviously is, is cost prohibitive for small farmers. Um, types of technology that enable the use of artificial intelligence. We're not using those kinds of things. Um, and if you bring in COVID-19 again, just from the perspective of our food security, we're not food secure at all. That's not news to anyone who's listening. We're importing about 80 to 90 percent of all the food that we're eating and now that we are concerned about s supply chain disruptions in the united states um we're wondering like 
what's going to happen? Our borders might be open to cargo ships, but if the food isn't coming, where are we going to get it from? So we do need to become more resilient in agriculture. Daphne, I really like that point because, you know, on the one hand, farming, permaculture, agroforestry, those techniques are a means for us to become more resilient and the, the technology in that is and 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 devices used in that um, are resilient by nature, but different Caribbean countries have different states of um, natural flora and fauna, and also different methodologies of farming, right? Uh, but one obvious uh, industry that was not up here that everyone's kind of worried about too is the tourism industry, and and. Um, Recently, I, I, I've seen a lot of reports about how, how things are going to change moving forward. So that leads me to my next question for the panelists is, um, given what has happened with the coronavirus COVID-19, how has that changed your perception of the meaning of resilience for the Caribbean? And Anaiti, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> I always get the first one. I'm one of those students that it's hiding, <laughs> so I don't get the question. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm I'm happy to respond. And and I I think you know with with COVID nineteen, I have to say that my my concept of resilience hasn't changed that much. But in re but. I have, I have, I have come to realize and and uh, that it is really a balancing game when it comes to resiliency. And almost, you know, uh, it seems like an impossible balancing game, you know, because when 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 you think about resilience, you have to think about you know, structural resilience financial resilience and also a capacity of countries to respond in fast and quick and agile on, on emergencies. And, and those three aspects really make the, the whole of, of resilience almost like a, a holistic concept. Um, now with COVID-19, what I have possibly what has uh, maybe adjusted my, my understanding is that we need to to respond even when the data or the information is not perfect that has to be emergency response has to be there it has to be empowered and strengthened improved from from the highest political level to the community level and that's something that that in the caribbean we're still lacking and, and we need to work more on that then um Another aspect that COVID-19 has has brought uh, for me, uh, and it's it, you know being so close to the to the office of the Prime Minister and and the Ministry of Economic Growth in Jamaica, is the the, the political leadership. I think all of us are now you know looking at different leaders all over the world, and it's such a fantastic time to to take a look at and compare different approaches, different styles and, and political leadership, and most importantly, resilient leadership is something that, that COVID-19 has brought into the conversation. You know, we, uh, we have to, to, to have leaders that trust the experts, that have narrative control, but they're also transparent. And, and I think that aspect of, of resilient leadership is something that, that I'm definitely uh, in, including in, in my holistic concept of, of resilience. Well, I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there when it comes to leadership. Um, and you know, like leadership sometimes doesn't have to be uh, in terms of, of political leaders. You know, it can be in terms of individual civic action or organizations taking it upon themselves to to become social enterprises and building it into their metrics. Um, but Tamisha, I, I, how, I'd like to hear your opinion on how COVID has changed your perspective on what resiliency is. Um, I've been over here cheerleading all of, the, all of the points so far in different ways. But um, 
it's not necessarily my personal view on resilience because that hasn't shifted but organizationally when i took on a private philanthropic trust type setting moving away from multilateral traditional donors it was always about how do i make a fund accessible and as Anaiti said, agile to respond to the needs of the community and the community groups you work with. Um, and a month ago, I would have, you know, had a different thought process on resilient sectors and the different groups I work with. But it, it's, it's. I'm glad that we started the trust with being able to work with the organizations to see where they are and to help them. So whatever your project proposal was at the beginning as you know, shifts every single day, every single week based on capacity and changes and the humanness of the people trying to implement. We can't build resilience, we can't be ready for climate change without forgetting the humans who are implementing them at the same time. And uh, and my and looking at that poll and going back to the poll, I realized that I wouldn't have gone for agriculture. A month ago, maybe I'd have thought of agriculture, but agriculture is the most resilient ready sector because the farmers have been doing this, they know the earth, they know the soil, and so they've been preparing for, for decades and generations. Yes, and, and there is openness because they are literally feeding themselves every day based on this. Uh, and so it's been really interesting in the COVID situation to see the rise of local food and the importance of food security, which they've been screaming about for years. And so as a trust, we've decided to focus all of our fundraising efforts on 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 fewer areas for a greater impact so all our fundraising is around local food and a a, a bit of environmental preservation because you know the turtles are still going to come there's still things that will happen that need support but our focus is a lot about food generation and food security and bringing awareness to that that's happening um, i would actually have chosen the healthcare and social services sector as the least vulnerable um to climate as the least resilient to climate change the most vulnerable because climate change covid has brought to the fact that this is a disaster but not a hurricane so this is a disaster that is like drought and famine that countries have been facing for years but in the caribbean it's it's um it's something you know the, the hurricane comes it goes we kind of rebuild and we go back to status quo this is our first opportunity to really truly look at what resilience mean and it's not just surviving to the next hurricane season but changing our systems because if it's not covid in healthcare then we're dealing with dengue we're dealing with malaria we're dealing with diabetes and all of that is rooted into the the systems of local food of health health and wellness and of our vulnerable populations who are in times like these even more vulnerable than they were, were already so as Anaiti said, it's, it's a holistic approach to resilience that has come above because of, of the COVID crisis. So I'm, I'm positive in that, you know, it's, it's a buzzword, but now it's even more of a meaningful buzzword than it has been before. Yes, I, I agree with you. And, you know, I'm hearing a lot of, to synthesize the last two responses, you know, like we, the definition of resilience looking looking at what's happened with COVID is accessibility, agility of our societies to, to, to respond, you know, so responsiveness, it has to be holistic, has to be multifaceted. Um, and, you know, Daphne, I would, I would love to hear your perspective um, because I know with you, this is a time when you're super busy as, as a journalist every day, you know, um, how, how would you say your perspective has changed in light of what's going on and being plugged into the media? Okay, so first of all, I just have to applaud how eloquently both of these ladies have really um, put forward their answers to you. Um, I completely agree with them. Um, I'm, I, I do understand what um, Tamisha was saying about the healthcare sector. I still believe that um, we face the most issues around agriculture. Um, like them, I do um, see my concept of resilience as having been not so much changed, but enhanced, um, particularly in the area of diversifying economies. I believe that our economies in the region are too heavily reliant on tourism, and that has really come out for us now. 
And as a result of our over-reliance on the tourism industry, we're really, really afraid of the future right now. Nobody knows exactly when we're going to come around, what's going to happen with our economies. So this should be an opportunity for us to sort of take everything back into stock and, and, and see how we can diversify more. Um, it has also brought up the fact that food security is national security. And if we are not food secure, we cannot be resilient. Because if our people don't eat, then everything else is going to fall out of whack from there. We're not going to be healthy. None of our other sectors are going to perform. We can't have a successful tourism industry without a successful food industry. If we're not food secure, we can't feed our tourists. There is one area that has changed completely for me as a result of COVID-19, and that is how we deal with natural disasters. Because we are about to come into hurricane season, and I would say it's pretty much 100% chance that coronavirus will be here during hurricane season. And this is predicted to be a very, or not very active, but above average activity season. So what if we have a major hurricane? How are we going to evacuate people while still following the norm, the new norm, sorry, of social distancing? How are we going to put people into shelters with social distancing? You have the food security issues that already present themselves during a natu natural disaster. Now we have food security issues that are facing, we're facing as a result of coronavirus, and we have to combine those with the added issues of a potential hurricane. So that is one area that has become increasingly more problematic for us. Thank you. I, I, I completely agree. And, you know, this is not to, to scare people, but this is our reality. And I mean, you know, there are ways that we can work moving forward. So my next question is for you guys, how can, how can attendees or potential clients work with your particular organizations um, to find solutions? I can start. If yeah, that's sure. Um, we are always looking for great projects and proposals and, and ideas from groups and individuals. Um, I, I, I do work in Barbados, but we have a fund in St. Vincent. We have a fund in Mallorca, in Menorca. We have it in Ibiza. We have a Sri Lankan fund. And, and, buzz, and, and you know, these are all small tourism dependent states or, um, or, and territories. And the, the problems are the same. So it is about getting in touch to, to find out what, what we can do and what we can offer. A lot of organizations who are applying for funding, they need help. And they need the expertise that in, in, um, in uh, the, the, the hard skills, they need some technical expertise because they're, they're technical experts. We have a lot of technical experts who have the know-how. We have what, what, what is lacking is we have the people who are able to communicate the technical work they do to the general public. So we can talk about um, climate change, resilience, agro-processing, all these fancy words, but it doesn't mean anything. You know, health and safety and HACCP training doesn't mean anything to the general public. So the work like what Daphne is doing, every organization needs that to help translate what they're doing. And we love, our organization does does like to support those additional, that, that additional capacity that's needed to boost the work. There's a lot of great things happening in the Caribbean, but nobody knows about it. So we can't accurately represent our resilience because as NIT also said there's no data there is no no one's out there collecting what's really going on on the ground there are anecdotal stories here and there there's an impact Instagram story once in a while but there is really no on mass storytelling everybody if they think really hard they're like well you know I had this friend who had an uncle or a or an auntie who used to do this but we haven't coalesced that information in our space also I'm personally interested with our organization at the Trust, partnering with the diaspora. The diaspora is so untapped in the resilience movement for the Caribbean. Um, Martin, you're sitting up in not so warm Toronto right now, and there are <laughs> lots of Caribbean people across the world. Um, Masao is in England, um, in London, locked up somewhere. And it's we have so much brain power that can be used for e-volunteering and for supporting organizations in monitoring and evaluating all these skill sets that don't exist. So I, I, I'm really looking forward to finding opportunities to collaborate across these 
global networks to strengthen the organizations here in the region um, at the nonprofit level. So that's my pitch. Hmm. So I know Daphne, you might have to leave soon. So I wanted to just push that question towards you. How can uh, we work for the future and work with you, you know, um, to build resilience? Okay, well, I, first of all, thank you so much to Maisha for that plug. Um, to Maisha and I have actually talked in the past about doing some stuff together. Um, her not-for-profit that she works for is just amazing. Um, the, support that they are providing in Barbados. Um, I am here because I want to tell Caribbean stories. I am more passionate about the Caribbean than anywhere else. I am in complete agreement with Tamaisha that there is a lack of storytelling within the region. And as a result of that, we tend to be marginalized from global discussions. My goal my mission in life is to tell these stories to the world. So if you're doing something positive, if you want to get your message out there, if you're doing something that can help the environment of your country, wherever it is, no matter how small it is, email me at um, Daphne Ewing Chow at iCloud.com and I, I will listen to your story. I don't care if you're a small farmer or own a massive company, it matters none to me. I want to tell great stories from the region and I want to bring exposure to these stories outside so that not only will people hear about what we're doing within the region and divorce themselves from this old-fashioned view that we're only sun, sea and sand, but it will also bring us before investors so that we can get money for these great projects. Thank you so much, um, Daphne. And Anaiti, you know, like how, how can People work with you, you know, as a climate finance consultant, um, and then also with the office of the prime minister, you know, of Jamaica, uh, to advance resilience. Um. Um, well, you know, when when you're sitting uh, in in a public sector in the, within the public sector, you know that that question for me has to do a lot with holding our leaders accountable and of decisions you know you know actively participating in the democratic exercise and and really voicing your opinions and asking the right questions we cannot just you know and, and this is something that that translates into into any country we can not expect the government to solve every single problem we have to take proactive approaches into into not only you know putting our opinions out there being more vocal and and we have a fantastic you know young leaders all over the caribbean uh, community leaders people that really are doing fantastic and and really interesting uh, projects and, and creating and, and coming up with with good solutions for resiliency in different sectors. So definitely, there's there's a need to to step up and speak up, and 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 get involved. There's uh, now in in the context of of COVID nineteen, I have seen also uh, a, a, the 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 uh, the emerge uh, a lot of initiatives on on crowdfunding and to mobilize those you know donations and philanthropic um, uh, resources that are coming from different organizations from companies from the diaspora and those you know crowd crowdfunding initiatives or platforms are being created by average citizens and that is the kind of solutions that that you know from a government perspective that's the kind of things that we want to see you know the the capacity of saying all right we have problems, but we also can come up with solutions. And, and, and if that solution requires some collaboration with the government, well, so be it, and, and, and that we can do. Um, and then sector, when, when you're working in different sectors, in different institutions, there's a lot of, of need for interagency coordination for each person that works within the the public sector and, and officers to understand and look for the opportunities in which we can create resiliency in different sectors. 
and, and support the, the climate change agenda, support the, the national determined contributions, support the climate targets, and, and, and contribute to, to, to you know, incorporate uh, not only climate change considerations, but climate risk into, into the, the planning of each of these sectors. This is, this is a time when I will say all hands, all hands on deck. Everybody needs to contribute. There's yeah. nobody that can say there's there's nothing I can do. Uh, that that time is long, long gone. If you are not somehow contributing to the climate change agenda, to building resilience in the Caribbean, to to you know transforming these these uh, societies into low carbon from whatever you are, then you're dropping the ball. Well, I 100% agree with all of you. Um, one thing that I, before we go into Q&A, that really stands out to me um, is that this event with COVID has really brought us to the point where we do have to collaborate. And that's, and based on what you're saying, you know, coordination of resources and also equity and ownership as we restructure our, um, restructure our societies to be more resilient, um, I think, those are two themes that we need to explore further. And those could be an entirely new webinar <laughs> in the future. But at this point, I want to switch to um, questions from the audience for, for the panelists. And um, I, I figured we could turn on um, the webcam at this point, just so that you know we get to know who you guys are um, for the Q&A and have a bit of a round table. We do have about 12 more minutes left. So one question that came in was, as a lay person interested in the topics, uh, are we defining resilience as readiness for the consequences of climate change or the ability to resist limit um, climate change or both? The ability to do what? Sorry, Martin. To, to the ability to resist or limit climate change or resist or limit climate change it so to me resilience encompasses adaptation and mitigation it requires proactive planning it's all of the above you i think what COVID has taught us is that you can't just respond to something you once you see that something looks like it's going to happen you need to act early those countries that have put shelter in place orders late are the countries that are suffering the most. As, as, um, as Anita said, you have to, once you see something is very likely coming to you, listen to the science, even if it's not perfect and start acting early. And you know, again, Martin, I, I don't want to be too, be, to be too prescriptive. Uh, for defining resiliency, and we shouldn't. Um, yeah. We shouldn't be caught up in 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 trying to, to to find the perfect definition of resiliency. I I think you know to resiliency for me is is the capacity to to respond, to resist, to absorb, to adapt, to recover in a timely and efficient manner, and and there's no perfect solution or form. Or, or formula for it, you know, to to adapt in the Caribbean, we have to understand what's our vulnerability, not only physical but economic vulnerability. Once you understand the vulnerability from wherever you are, then you can effectively take decisions to build resiliency. And by building resiliency, you know, you better adapt and you better live and, and you ensure long-term sustainability. So again, this, these are concepts that are not divorced, uh, that should be used as, as all as, as a strategy for better outcomes. And, and to, to my yeah, share. Uh, okay. um, uh, with resiliency, it's, it's uh, as they said, it's not, it's not about, for me, it's not about um, ch is chicken always going to be chicken versus egg? What will come first? We're going to keep chasing the the next disaster, but it's about being efficient as a region. 
uh, what what all the climate change things show is that we're not efficient. We have no continuity plan. We don't know, um, and it's not doomsday preparation. It's how can we, if anything happens, whether it be a volcano, an earthquake, um, a hurricane, COVID, whatever it is, we need to be able to deal and get up and get going much faster uh, in different, uh, in, for our economy and just for our people in general. So it's it's not about uh, disaster, prepare for the disaster, it's impending. It's We're gonna be on that race and that rat wheel forever and ever. It's about how do we make our systems ready to to adapt for anything even a yeah, zombie but, apocalypse <laughs> even <laughs> even um you know like i you know i was just gonna wear my electricity and carolac hat here and one thing that has come to my mind is the ability to have rapid market intelligence and 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 energy energy data um that's just one idea that comes to mind because if we can understand yeah what understand what the the impact of covid is in all these different sectors as it is happening and correlate that data then we can make better investments i think um we have a baseline for investment if if you get what i'm saying um should this crisis happen again and should other crises crises be put on top of that um, I think that's actually one of our greatest vulnerabilities. Um, we lack data. We, we don't do a good job within the region in knowing from a numerical perspective um, where we're at. We don't have solid metrics. And that, that has to be a goal for the future, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, absolutely, you know, if, if, if we start thinking uh, about, you know, fiscal resilience, uh, and that is something that I can tell you from, from, from the government in, uh, of Jamaica uh, perspective, you know, the Caribbean has to really find the ways to build a strong and, and um, fiscal resilience. If we don't have the capacity to respond to, to, to disasters economically, then, uh, you know, even our climate targets and or all the, the things that we want to do, even if it's, a, you know, if it's immobility, if it's, you know, uh, uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, uh, efficient transportation, low carbon, all of that is easily, you know, can become easily wishful thinking fiscal resilience, being able to, to, to have in place the strategies for, for pre-disasters and post-disasters, all the governments in the Caribbean need to really put together those strategies in place for, for fiscal resiliency and disaster risk management. Without that, we are going to be continuing the vicious cycle of loans, you know, disaster, loan, pay, recovery, you know, next disaster, loan, borrow, debt, and so forth. And then we'll never see the, we, we will never attain that type of, of low carbon uh, dreams that we all have, because that's, that's the, the Caribbean we want, right? So uh, fiscal and financial resiliency, it's for me the key in all of this. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you're, that that touches on something that I I often think about is the cost of resiliency. And you know, a lot of planning has been done in the past, at least cost planning. Um, but I think with this, you know, the the horizon that we look at has to be the, the ten, the twenty year, twenty years out, like the high upfront costs. And so one of the questions that came in was like, how do we pay for this? You know, given the points about insurance and finance and fiscal like what are your thoughts on how we could start preparing ourselves to pay for this and it's so I, i'm going to stop there <laughs> <laughs> how do we pay for this that's the the million dollar question i know right <laughs> maybe multi-million dollar question <laughs> you know i think um I am going to speak on a personal capacity here and I'm going to, you know, take off my, my, uh, you know, office of the prime minister in Jamaica hat and, and, you know, make the disclaimer that I'm not speaking on behalf of the government at this point. Uh, yeah. But there is definitely uh, 
a need to to rethink taxes. Um, you know, there's a, a need to rethink trade. Uh, there is a need to put together and put in place the necessary incentives for technological, you know, change and, and shifts that are necessary in the region. Uh, there is a need to, to push the private sector to step in and to collaborate with the government. You know, we have public and private partnerships. Uh, we have to, to work in terms in, at the government level, in, you know, to improve the frameworks of, of how we do transactions with the private sector. So the private sector can also pitch in and more than pitch in, can, you know, get, esteem, you know, get motivated to invest in, in, in other infrastructure, you know, changes and investments that we need to do. We need to, to update the water infrastructure in our countries, waste management. We need to improve the energy infrastructure. And those are, there are opportunities for the private sector to come in. But again, you know, we need to understand physical risk. We need to have the data available and um, we need to, to put together those kind of, uh, you know, that kind of enabling environment for the, for the private sector to come and, and invest. And, um, and I'm gonna stop there and let anybody else to, to come on board. And I completely agree with you, Anita. I think, um, maybe a sort of a summary of what you're saying is that we basically have to build ourselves up from within. And I absolutely agree that there needs to be more public-private partnership, but there also needs to be more integration within the region. I don't think that we work together enough, <laughs> right, Tamisha? <laughs> I, I think that we rely too much on the United States. I which I keep coming back to food because obviously that's my field. We need to become more food secure and food security for me is also relying on our neighbors to fill the voids that each of our different islands have. We need to work together more. Where globalization is amazing, sovereignty is also amazing. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I think there, yeah, there was I was just throwing it up, so I, I, I wanted to hear her thoughts. <laughs> I'm a shameless fan and believer in the integration movement. So it does my whole perspective is grounded in a belief of the, the the need and the the benefits and the hope that comes from interregional exchange and support. Um how I see it is obviously from a community level and, and what that sharing of community ideas and knowledge can do to build a region. You asked about how we're paying for this. It is about all of us who sit on our couches and blame the government and wait for them to do something when we need to put our own money where our, mouth, where, where our mouths are to feed ourselves, to support local farmers and to support the people and the organizations doing the good work. We're always, wait, we're always waiting for, you know, one thing to happen and then oh maybe we'll get involved but we don't hesitate to jump on a plane and go to carnival and pay for our parties but we yeah. always hesitate when it comes from supporting environmental or local causes that will make our everyday lives a lot more resilient and enhanced so i i do believe it's it's the community of, of the caricom community needs to get together not from a political perspective only but from each of us as citizens playing our part in our islands and sharing these networks and resources across the across the islands and so but i'll come off my you know, soapbox you know i always think that if the european union with so many countries and different countries with different backgrounds and and a diversity of people who come Languages up and uh, with a regional resilience and strategy why can't CARICOM and the Caribbean come up with a resilience strategy as well. There's nothing stopping us from putting our hats together, our heads together, and come up with with certain policy, regional policy adjustments that can help accelerate our our climate, um, our climate, you know, transition, a low carbon transition. Yeah. Well. Well. I'm just going to stop this here because I know some of you have meetings right now. Um, 
and I turn on my webcam because I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time to out of your day to share this perspective. Of course, it's an expansive topic, and um, I look forward to seeing how you advance with your organizations and working with you. And also, I want to thank the audience who have been so engaged. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Caesar, you can go to caesarjournal.org um, and reach out to Mazeo, Dr. Mazeo Ashtin, who's in the background uh, listening. Um, and if you want to learn about the Carrick website as well, uh, where we do more of renewable energy, you go to carrick.community.org. Um, thank you very much, and you guys have a great weekend. A shelter thank in place. You. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for participating.